Testing, testing one, two, three. All right, let's go live here. Hello there, can you hear me? I'm trying a new audio setup. I can hear you, yes. Good, good, good. Does it sound good? Um, it's normal. I mean, okay. I, I'm also not on my, I, I'm, on, I'm not on my regular setup, so I, I don't know, but um, sounds okay. Okay. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't cancel. It's Veterans Day and company holiday and you still have the meeting. Yeah, I do this uh, every Friday. Okay. Pretty much no matter what. Okay. So rain or shine, we're here, we're interviewing people. Um, I even had my wisdom teeth out two days ago, and I'm still doing it. Ah. <laughs> and it hurts. <laughs> so we'll probably have the speaker speaking more. Yeah. Oop, I lost some sound here. Now, I'm streaming live to Facebook as well. So this is a new experience. And my cat is apparently getting in the way of the camera. Come on, kitty. All right. Over there, kitty. Hopefully people will show up. I know that, uh, you know, a lot of schools have the day off. Intel has the day off. And a lot of people wrote me back to, to, to inform me that the day was off. I, I I wasn't even expecting to show up, but it just happened that I have uh, I have a free moment. So okay, I dialed in early, so I don't forget. All right, cat, you're getting annoying. Hey, Jason, how's it going, buddy? Hey, Jason, how's it going, buddy? Hey, Daniel. Doing good, man. How are you doing? Good. I have been experimenting with taking the uh, Intel groups and putting them on Facebook. And so this is our normal Intel meeting, except for Intel actually officially has a day off today. So, uh, oh, wow. which I'm guessing that's why you're in. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I saw your uh, your little uh, message come through. Thought I, I thought I'd drop in and say hi. That's cool, man. Awesome. You, so is it it's Zoom and Facebook Live or just yep. one? Both. I'm using Zoom to stream to Facebook. Oh, huh. Okay. You know, it took me directly to Zoom. Yeah, this this one, this time it did. Facebook is difficult to get the hang of. Uh, for whatever reason, the button that let me stream live onto Facebook was grayed out. And I couldn't ungray it no matter what I tried. So uh, instead of making the Facebook live, I just sent everybody from Facebook over to Zoom. Interesting. I, I, I have to be careful. I'm I'm talking a lot. I just had a wisdom teeth out two days ago. My jaw oh, is all swollen. <laughs> ouch! That hurts. The speaker will be doing most of the talking. I hope. <laughs> yes. How are you doing? I I sent out our newsletter today. It took a few days to get it out, and the distribution went out two days ago. Very good. Yeah, man, it's cool. I'm good, man. Um, yeah, I'm off today, but I, I worked basically the entire day anyway. <laughs> I know, it's right? It's very busy lately, um, but I got caught up. I'm completely caught up now, which I'm happy about. Okay. Let's see. There is a streaming event on Facebook right now. Seems to be working.
There's our speaker. Hello. John, I, I'm going to have to tell you that uh, I'm not going to be quite as loquacious as I normally am. I had uh, wisdom teeth taken out just here two days ago. So oh, okay. it might be you talking a lot more than me. That's totally so usually fine. It's a dialogue. But, oh, I see. Okay. So we have some people from Intel that are coming today and some okay. people from Facebook. Uh, Intel okay. officially has a holiday today, though. So we might, uh, you might be getting more people in the, in the, picking up more people listening in the recording because we also post it to our group. So gotcha. I'm not sure what the live turnout will be, but um, okay. yeah. And like I said, I'm probably going to have you talk a little bit more than I talk today. That, that that actually works out perfect because I have a uh, a, a whole presentation, like a lot of things I want to get through um, to okay. sort of go over. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob. Hi, Brad. Howdy. Hi, Daniel. So, Bob, I got to figure out how to get the invite to you on a regular basis since you're you're now retired from Intel and you don't go to Facebook. Yeah, I got to figure out if I'm going to be assimilated and just get over it. Don't do it because <laughs> of me. <laughs> I I certainly was drugging, kicking and screaming, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So far, the only social media I have is LinkedIn, and I'm not even sure if that's really social media. <laughs> All right. Nisi is looking for the link. Actually, was anybody did anybody so, join this meeting through Facebook? You you did, right, Jason? You found the link. So it might be. So I got confused. Uh, the The link that you sent out comes with the meetup.intel.com stuff. But then if you look somewhere else, there is the um, Zoom link. So if she's maybe clicking. Was that the, the one that area. I sent to you or one? You yeah, yeah, the one that you sent to me. So if, okay. if she wasn't, if she's not paying attention, she could be accidentally clicking on the Intel link instead of the Zoom link. Well, me, me see is from Walmart. So but, right, but if you sent her a same link as I did. If you send her a different link, then no big deal. Yeah, I send her send... a different link. Ah, okay. <laughs> that I said. Okay, okay. The non-Intel people don't get the Intel links. Try Got to it. keep that as separate as possible. <clears throat> Is anybody able to access the live feed on Facebook? Is it working? We're brand new at doing this. So we're just getting it up. All right, let's wait for two more minutes as people start joining. And of course, you can always see this posted in our Facebook group, which is Real Estate Investing for Busy Professionals. And that's where you will find all of the videos. If you're at Intel, you can also find them on our internal SharePoint site. But let me drop the uh, link to our Facebook group here into the chat. And then we can get going with John Bianchi. Do you say Bianchi or or Bianchi? How do you say Bianchi, the last name? Bianchi. What's it's, that? Uh, Bianchi. Bianchi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of different ways of saying it. I'm good with any way it comes out, so no worries. <laughs> All right, I'm going to drop our Facebook group here in the chat. Feel free to join. And let's get started. John Bianchi, you're the Air D &D, Airbnb D data guy. And so welcome to the group here. Most of us here are engineers or data-driven people. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'll let you take it away. Awesome. This is going to be uh, a lot of fun. So just to point out right off the bat, I do not have a data background. This is all self-taught, learned as I was 
just trying to find the answer of how much will this Airbnb make before I actually sign the lease. And so I've got a, a presentation of my process, how I logically think about these through, through these things and trying to answer a lot of the questions that people ask me. But I want to give you a little bit of a, a background beforehand. Is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah. All right. Awesome. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm the head of data for Superhost Labs, which is a short-term rental investment fund. I believe you guys actually had my boss come and speak on here about a month or so ago, uh, Seif from Superhost Labs. Yeah. So he's my boss and I'm the head of data. And uh, you know we work together and it's, it's my job to analyze every single market across the United States and dissect it and try and figure out where the most profitable Airbnbs are within that market. And then uh, every single property that comes by or through, I have to analyze to figure out if it's a worthy property to purchase or not um, before actually, you know, buying it, right? And we've bought about 55 properties, raised 22 to $25 million so far. Um, and this is, you know, year one. So that's my, that's my day job. Um, I've also had an Airbnb company. I had about 15 Airbnbs in Chicago uh, before COVID. When COVID hit, I sold off all of the contracts that I had. Um, and then I also am the founder of Point Analytics, which is an Airbnb data consulting company, where I work with people to um, help them know exactly how much their Airbnb is going to make before they ever buy the property, and also how to find the most profitable properties with any market that they're into, they're going into. Um, and then additionally, I have three free Airbnb courses, Airbnb data courses on YouTube, they can go through and just learn my entire process, how I think about things and, and everything along those lines. So that's a little bit of my resume and my background. Uh, once again, did not go to school for anything data related. So you guys could probably walk circles around me, but this process has actually worked out fairly well for me. Um, and you'll probably have a lot of questions for me. So the first thing I want to start on, or sort of to summarize everything that I plan on going through here, is I want to I want to walk you through the very start to the very end of um, what market should I go into, and then all the way down to signing the contract to pur purchase the property, right? And sort of every step that happens in between there. Um, but we're to start off with, we have to think about what market you want to go into. And uh, I don't know everyone's background here, but most of the time people are trying to figure out what is the best market to be going into to purchase an Airbnb. And a lot of people are open to buying an Airbnb absolutely anywhere now. So um, this is you know my standard advice to anybody. If you're in a market that is uh, Airbnb favorable, like you, there is demand for Airbnb, there's travel, always, always, always stay within your market because it's going to be the easiest to get things going in your own market than anywhere else, hands down, always, right? Now, the next place is just pick a place that you enjoy to visit. If you have a location that you like to go with your family, that you're okay with going to, you know, one, two, three times a year, because you might have to if you own that property there, then that's the next place that you should go, right? Now, on top of this, what I usually always mention is that um, there are tons and tons and tons of markets out there that are investable, right? So there's there's hundreds of markets that actually can produce the return that you're looking for. And it's just a matter of picking one that you, that you actually like, right? And, and if you like it, then it'll make it a lot easier when you're actually going through it. Now, if you do not care whatsoever about the market that you're going into, then at that point, you can analyze the the every single possible market and try and figure out which one's going to give you the absolute best return, right? And the method that I have for that um, is... There's, there's a method that I use on AirDNA to be able to determine how profitable a specific market is going to be. There's two certain data points that I look at that help me know if one market is better than the other market. Um, and I'm going to walk you through that process right now. So if anyone's not used AirDNA, AirDNA is a, um, a Airbnb, it's an Airbnb data software. What it does is it tracks the calendar of every single Airbnb that exists across the entire world every single day records all that information and then uploads it into this um, software here. And so the main things that I'm looking for are right here, which is the revenue on a monthly basis. So the average revenue on a monthly basis, and then the number of listings within said market, right? And the reason I find these two important is because when you compare these two side by side, like two, uh, two different markets side by side, you can get a general idea if it's one's doing better than the other. And so um, the, the way I always like to think about this is that this number here, is the person right in the middle. So the person right in the middle is making this much on average, right? Now, the further I, the further I get away from that middle number to the top performer, the more that number is going to grow. And so when I see we're, uh, that our base is around 60,000 and that we're, we can go a little bit higher, there's about 200 people making more than that, that tells me that this market can make quite a bit more, right? Now, once again, when you're looking at just one market, it's not all that helpful. But when you directly compare it to another market, it becomes a little bit easier to uh, see a difference. So 
here's, you know, we're in the Poconos right now. We're looking at Lake Harmony and I'm going to move over to an, another lake that's very close to this one, just to get a general idea of which one's better between these two, just looking at these two numbers, right? And what you'll see is that on the left-hand side over here, we have almost the exact same amount of listings. However, the revenue has dropped by about 1500, right? On average. So right away, I know that Lake Harmony is probably a place I want to take a look at at least first um, and determine if that might be the right place to go. However, if um, you know, Pocono Lake has cheaper real estate in comparison to Lake Harmony, then, you know, then we can consider moving over there. So anyways, that's just a quick way to determine if one market is better than the other. Um, and I have one other example here as well, which is Chicago. Uh, Chicago's got 6,500 listings and on average they're doing about 3000, right? So, you know, there's about 3000 people doing better than $3,000 a month. Um, and if you compare that to another market such as uh, Jacksonville, you can see Jacksonville on average is doing 2,000 um, and there's only 2,000, 2,600 listings. So like significantly less money being made in Jacksonville. Now, naturally, if you think about it, of course, Chicago is going to be better than Jacksonville. Um, but in general, you know, this is a, a very quick way to determine it. And when you have a huge list, it makes it a lot easier. So that is my uh, standard advice and process for analyzing these different markets to determine which one would be better to go in than the other. Now, the way that I do my research, um, now we're going to get into sort of like the, into the market. Now we've selected the market, let's get into the market, right? And there's a logic that I use, which is the Burger King logic. So McDonald's spends millions of dollars to figure out what corner to be on and Burger King opens up across the street, right? They're essentially just replicating what is already working. And that's what we're doing here. So we're looking for the, um, the, the, the properties. We're looking for some sort of pattern that we can repeat, right? Um, now, moving forward. So most of you guys already know this. So what is data? Why is data important? I love the definition of data. It's facts and statistics collected together to uh, for reference and analysis, right? Essentially, what, what the whole point of data, and usually when I give this presentation, I'm not talking to a bunch of data people, but uh, usually, so with data, the main thing that we use, we get from it is being able to find a repeatable pattern, right? Some sort of consistency in the pattern. When we see that, we know that we can repeat that process, right? Um, which is the idea of Burger King replicating McDonald's. Now, there's a six-step process that I use to be able to determine how profitable a specific property is going to be or where the most uh, money is being made within any given market, right? Now, when you look on AirDNA, right? So let's pull up AirDNA here for uh, Phoenix, Arizona, right? When, you, when you're on AirDNA and you look at Phoenix, Arizona, every single one of these dots is a different Airbnb, Right. And you have, you have there's there's uh, 5,800 dots on this screen that have pieces of information that are super helpful. And then we can open up the listing and there's even more data in there that we can collect as well. Well, my process for this is um, extracting all of this market data and organizing it and sorting it into a way that I can then start to see the patterns that I'm looking for. And then I can start making sense of it and then I can create a buy box. So I literally extract all the data and then I organize it neighborhood by neighborhood. That way, um, you know, you're, you're in the, there's some neighborhoods that have more demand than other neighborhoods and some neighborhoods are more desirable. And so you just want to make sure that you break it up neighborhood by neighborhood. And then additionally, you break it up by bedroom count. So one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom. And now you have this nice organized uh, data set with, uh, once again, only good data. So we're, we would remove all of that bad data as we've been going through there. It's organized by different neighborhoods and it's organized by the different unit sizes as well, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you an example of what this process looks like for Phoenix, Arizona. Okay, so this is this report that you're looking at here. It's a pivot table with uh, all of the data for uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And it's I've essentially extracted all of that data and plugged it into this spreadsheet. And on the left hand side, what we have are all the different unit sizes within, or sorry, on the left hand side, what we have are all the different zip codes within Phoenix, Arizona, and they're in order of where the most listings are to where the least amount of listings are, right? Then up top, what you have are all the different unit sizes. So a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom so on and so forth. Where those two connect is the average annual revenue for an Airbnb in that area. So one bedroom within this zip code makes about $28,000 a year on average. Some are doing better, some are doing worse, right? The way I explain people to use this is you just simply look for the highest average. You look for the biggest number because that's likely where the most money is going to be made, right? One of my favorite little insights from this sheet is if you look at the two bedrooms, you can see in this zip code, they're averaging about $34,000 a year. However, the, five be the three bedrooms are averaging $90,000 a year. So very instantly, you know, I should not be looking at um, two bedrooms. I should be looking at three bedrooms. Additionally, 
as you were to move forward, you would realize that the four bedrooms are only making slightly more and same with the five bedrooms. Therefore, the three bedrooms are the most efficient thing in this zip code that you could uh, purchase, right? And so very quickly, we're able to dissect all of Phoenix and know where within Phoenix we would want to start to, to do our research, like what neighborhood, but then also um, have an idea of what unit size we should be focus, focusing into as well, right? And if you look over at uh, AirDNA, right? It's a very difficult thing to do on AirDNA, but if you manually start pulling all this information out, we start to see the patterns, right? And the trends, and that's what data is all about. And that's why this process tends to work. So this here, what I'm just showing you is what I refer to as the tip of the iceberg. This is the starting point. It's where it allows you to narrow into what neighborhood you wanna be in. But now we have to figure out what is it about that neighborhood or what is it about that unit size um, that is allowing some people to make more than the others, right? And so from there, what you would do is you would double click into that information. And it's gonna pop open um, all of the data from that area, right? So what I'm showing you right now is sort of like my completed research of, of a specific section in Phoenix. And so each row here is a is the extracted data for um, each Airbnb listing within this specific zip code, and they're all four bedrooms. So each row is a different Airbnb, and the, each column is a different data point. So you can see we have all four bedrooms, all within the exact same area. And the main thing that we have here is actually the revenue. So how much these places are actually making, and then we have the actual links as well. And the reason I love this is because you can see right here, we have a beautiful pattern of homes that are all roughly making around $100,000 a year. And this is no, it's not just random. Each one of these homes roughly looks the same and offers the same sort of experience and the same sort of amenities, right? And so what I help people and teach people to do, and this is, you know, there's a course here on YouTube for free, you can go through that, but you essentially learn how to dissect and understand each one of these um, each, each one of these listings and what it is about these listings that's allowing them to hit the numbers that they're hitting, right? And so you go through it and you're looking for specific things. And I got a list here of the things that you want to be specifically looking for, right? You're looking to try and figure out like if there's a view on that property, what is the quality of that view? So say you're in like Blue Ridge, Georgia and you have a, a cabin on a, on a hill and you've got this absolutely unobstructed, beautiful view with rolling hills. That's like an amazing, amazing view, right? But what if you were like lower in on the hill and there's some sort of tree coverage and you can't perfectly see rolling hills, you can just kind of see out. Well, that's a completely different view. And I swear to you, those different views will make a huge difference on your revenue and how much you make. And so you have to know that before you actually buy the property because that's gonna change how much your property is gonna make, right? Now, another example is like, you're looking for pools and pool heaters. Um, one mistake that I made when I actually was first getting started and I opened up my first place in, in uh, Scottsdale, I didn't realize that you needed a pool heater and I, I lost about $20,000 of revenue because I didn't have a pool heater, right? Um, a hot tub is another great one. If you don't have a hot tub, so if everybody has a hot tub and you don't have a hot tub, you're going to lose out on, on, on all of those properties as well. You could have everything else, right? You could have, you can have even have different amenities like a pool table that that person doesn't have. But if everybody has a hot tub, you don't have a hot tub, you're going to lose out on that. Um, now square footage, square footage is a really hard thing to determine when you're actually looking at a lot of Airbnbs, cause it doesn't say what the square footage is. Right. And also square footage in a bedroom compared to a living room kind of differ on how, uh, ideal your property is going to be, right? Or how well your property is going to do. So when you're looking at these um, Airbnb listings, you're reviewing all the different properties, what you want to be looking for is like, how many living rooms are there, right? Are there two, three living rooms? Is there just one living room? These things matter because whether the guest knows it or not, they're booking the home that's almost always bigger for the better deal, right? They may not know that this home's 2,500 square feet compared to 3,000 square feet, but they can see that this one has two living rooms and the extra living room has a pool table and all that fun stuff. Whereas the other one doesn't have that amenity and feature and they feel like it's gonna probably be a little bit tighter. So I promise you that does matter. I had, uh, my, my main focus was actually um, four bedrooms in Chicago. And there, if I didn't get a dining room within my home that I was getting, so if there was no dining room, which is very common in Chicago, then I would make $75,000 a year. If I had a dining room, I'd make $100,000 a year. Just that little bit of difference is what allowed me to drive up the revenue because that was one of the most crucial uh, key amenities that you needed to have within that style of home. Um, and so some other things as well is you want to make sure like the listing quality is really nice, like good photos, all that stuff when you're, when you're comparing it, because a, a home that has really bad photos compared to a home that really has great photos, regardless if they're the exact same, the one's going to make significantly less. Um, you're looking for like big, big things like rooftop patio, you know, what's the kitchen and bathroom look like? Um, the interior design, is it really high level? Is it really boring? 
Uh, is there a game room? What kind of extra entertainment are there? And you're, you're, what you're doing is you're making a list of all these things that you're seeing as you're going through all of this data, right, uh, in, a, in an organized format. Because now we have it organized, now we're going through it, we're trying to make sense of it. And essentially what ends up happening is you come up with a, a buy box. You've created a, a, I can buy this within this specific area, right? So as an example, this is a real example. Um, you know, I went through all this data and I figured out that you could buy a home between 100 and $140,000, or sorry, you can, if you bought a home in this area, four bedroom, it can make between 100 and $140,000 a year. And we like to use this 20% rule. So if the revenue is 20% of the purchase price, we know that we can buy it, right? It's very easy to be like, yep, we can buy that. So therefore we can, the home value could be somewhere between 500 and 700,000, right? However, the home needs to have a private pool. It also needs to have a pool heater. The backyard must be larger than just the pool area. It has to be large enough to also have a fireplace, sunbathing chairs, a putting green, and a hot tub, right? Additionally, the kitchen should be newer and bigger, right? Ideally, if you have those two things, because all the top performers, they, they had those two things, right? Now, uh, the last thing here is you actually need to have uh, two living rooms because you need to have a, a game room or a pool table room along with your living room as well. So if you can have all of these things, right? And be to the right of this highway, and the closer you are to this little circle here, the more money you're going to make, right? So I know that I can make between 100 and 140 thousand dollars if I hit all of these things. And so the next thing that you would do here, because you've now created a buy box, is go over to Zillow and put in all of those filters, right? So I put in that I want a house for sale. Um, I put up to 750 just in case you know we can bargain it down to 700. Um, I know I want a four bedroom, but so I put exact, I want a house. And then additionally, um, I want the lot size to be at least 5,000 square feet because it's, because I said, I need a nice big backyard. Right. And it has to have a pool. So if it meets all of these requirements, then I can, uh, potentially make between hundred and hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. And as you can see, here's that highway that I referred to. And then here's the little circle here, which is like the little tourist trap. And, and they said, the closer I got to that, this little thing here, the more money I would make. And as you can see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten homes that all meet the criteria of this buy box, right? And now all of these homes are homes that could potentially actually cash flow um, in Phoenix, Arizona. So this process, if you follow it and you go thoroughly and you take the time to extract all of that information and organize it and sort it and then make sense of it and, and track the things that actually matter, you end up being able to figure out exactly what you can purchase before you ever actually go there and buy, right? And I love this method because we're going from the top down. So we're going from, we're looking at the entire market and then we're narrowing it all the way down to like the most tiny little things. Whereas a lot of people, what they do is they go, hey, look at this property. It's within my budget. Can this property make uh, enough money for me to buy it, right? That's sort of what I refer to as like bad way because you might find a property that works, right? You might end up landing on property. But what if it's not the most profitable property within that market or, or for your budget, right? And so by doing it this way, you're ensuring that you're actually finding the most profitable possible um, property for your budget within any market that you're going to be going into. And you're going to feel super, super confident before you actually end up purchasing that property. So that's the... That's the method that I go through. That's the logic that I go through. That's some of the things that I look for as I'm going through it. It's a, it's a very step-by-step -step process. Um, the, the, the whole logic behind it, once again, is the Burger King logic. And, uh, you know, that's pretty well it. I like covered as much as I possibly could there um, as fast as I could. And Daniel, how was that? Did I, get, did I cover enough? Do you have any questions for me? As I, I can keep going on some other stuff. Um, I know I probably went a little too quick, but what do you yeah, think? You know, there are quite a few people in the chat that have questions. So okay, I'm going to let them take themselves off mute. We can start with Henry, if you're there. <clears throat> Hi, um, my question is for the Air DNA. Is that, do you have to pay a subscription for that? Or can you get away with a free subscription? And how much does the subscription cost? So um, you can get the, these data points here. So like this and this, that's going to be free. And you can type in any location that you want. They'll show you that. But if you wanted to get like the actual, uh, so if I hover over this, I have the statewide access, but um, this number here and this number here will, will be hidden if you don't have a subscription. And the subscription costs usually about $99. If it's a really small market, it'll be about $40. But for the most part, it's $99 per month. Um, you can get a nationwide one, which is going to be like $1,000 a month, but you really don't need it. So you don't have to worry about that one. Thank you. No problem. All right, Anita, do you have a question? 
Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, um, I've been seeing a lot of stories in the news about Airbnbs, um, you know, not being rented or the Airbnb market going down. What has been your experience or have you been seeing that within your listings? Uh, no, not at all. So we have not, but I'm not overly surprised that that is happening. Um, just simply because a lot of what I'll refer to as like low level performers have thought that they could just, you know, buy a home and throw it up on Airbnb and expect for it to actually get the bookings just to, just to get bookings without actually putting the effort in. Um, but Airbnb is one of these markets that has been maturing over the last like uh, 12 to 15 years. And people are just getting better and better and better and better and putting together nicer and nicer places and creating really great, uh, nice experiences. And so the listings that we have at uh, Superhost Labs, they're all what I like to refer to as like top tier listings. I'm not saying that as like a brag. It's just I've looked at all of the different listings and we very purposely put together a home that creates an experience. And by doing that, you're setting yourself above everybody else. And so um, people are using Airbnb, right? They're using Airbnb. They're booking on Airbnb. Even if there is a recession that's going to happen, people are still going to travel and they're going to keep using Airbnb. Our goal is that if there's a thousand Airbnbs and only a hundred are getting booked out, we want to be one of those hundred that get booked out. And that's how, that's sort of like our safety net, right? To ensure that we're actually going to be able to continue to get booked and, and not have to worry too much about recession and, and things like that. But you do have to put together a really strong listing. Like you just, you have to put in the effort to make it nice. You have to put in the effort to take great photos. And that's what's going to allow you to get to that level. And I'm actually going to pull up some examples. Um, as we're speaking, but we can go to the next question if you want. Feel free just to take yourselves off mute and ask questions. I will do that. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> um, hope you feel better soon. Um, John, uh, how do you identify oversaturated market? As you know, in some of these markets, people just pop up any of their long-term rentals into short-term rentals. What indicators do you see? Okay, so... Let me go, Nashville is a good example of this. So um, I'm looking at the, the supply and the revenue um, and trying to see what the trend looks like. You know what, I actually have a better. So on your DNA, I'm gonna show you two things here. So on your DNA, you can go to the rental growth and it's gonna show you how many listings that they've gotten. And so what I like to do is just go year over year, right? So, um, so last year, Q3, there was 6,800 and now there's uh, 8,600 which is an increase of 2000 listings almost into 7,000. So roughly like what, like 15, 18% increase in listings, right? Um, and then if you hop over here to the revenue section and you have to have a subscription to get this information um, for like this specific information, right? If you hop over here, you can go to the total revenue, right? So now I can look at the total revenue for um, Nashville and they break it up between apartments, houses, and unique states. I'm just going to kind of look at those first two and I'm seeing 51 million was made in October. Um, I'm going to go to October of last year. Wait, Q3 wouldn't make sense to you. Um, okay, so actually let's do, let's do the summer. So we'll go August. August there was uh, $44 million, $42 million, almost 43. And then last year there was Keep going. Last year is 2021, right? You're on 2020. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. No, no worries. They're very squished together. Yeah. Okay. So we're looking at 43. And then, okay. So I just skipped it. I see what I did there. All right. And um, 35. So an increase of about 7 million over 35, which is a 20% increase. So just using August alone, there was a 20% increase in revenue and an 18% increase in, um, in in total listings, right? So technically there was a 2% increase uh, per listing. So every individual listing made about 2% per more than they did the year prior for August. However, uh, there were 18% more listings that showed up on the market. Um, I have a better chart for this that I'm gonna show you. It'll explain it. So essentially just trying to see how many new listings were there uh, from one year to the other. And then how much revenue was there? Um, how did the revenue increase or decrease and keep up with supply over that time period? If it did, then the market is likely not oversaturated. 
Does that make sense? Uh, so, a little bit. Uh, I'm curious, uh, what's the, and there's, this is probably not the exact science. I wonder if there's a exact threshold um, between revenue versus listing growth rate difference. And like, for example, my market, Fayette, Arkansas is college town. And maybe we can dive into data if you have a minute, just as an example. Um, a few of the Airbnb hosts I talked to, they were like, hey, you know, we haven't been getting as much listings recently. And when we checked online, it seems like there's like 20, 30 percent more and blah, blah, blah. But you know, I haven't done the research. I'm a mom and pop operator. And I think so. Yeah. So you're so you're wondering, like, how do you know when the threshold is met? Is that the idea? Yeah. Yeah. When do you, when do you, yeah, the supply and demand threshold. Um, yeah. When do you be yeah. like, oh, well, this is a alert red <laughs> before it's like, oh, it's just yellow. <laughs> what you may, yeah. you know, so. Well, so you would, you would need to, to, to see if it's kind of hitting that mark, right? You would have to track it on a monthly basis. And then if you're seeing like a trend down, then you, you start getting worried, right? If it's if it's like the supply is increasing, but the revenue is starting to like decrease month over month, um, then at that point you should start getting concerned, right? Um, but th so this is a chart I'll show you that we did for a lot of different markets to try and understand uh, if they were oversaturated or not, right? And so we're looking at, you know, Q2 supply uh, from, from last year to this year, and we're seeing the increase. So you can see in Whitefish, there was an increase of about 14% year over year in the amount of Airbnb listings. However, the revenue in April was an increase of 113%. In May, it was an increase of 78%. In June, it was an increase of 20% for an average increase of 70%, right? Which tells us that uh, there was a total increase over these this time frame of 56%, which means that if for year over year. So if your listing made $10,000 last year, it's now making, it would have made $15,000 this year in that time frame. Does that make sense? There's a 56% increase. There's a, so even though there was 13, 14% more listings, each individual listing made 56% more. So quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. And if you track this, if you track these, just this, these simple data points, you can, you can figure out if a market is thriving or dying, right? And as you can see, all these top markets here, they're all increasing, even though the revenue, the, the supply is increasing, the, the revenue is actually outpacing the supply. So there's, there's more demand that's showing up in these specific markets, right? Whereas if you flip the switch on that and you go to all of these markets down here, the supply also increased in all these markets, but the revenue started to drop off to the point where each individual listing was making quite a bit less, right? So as a, in this example here, LJ, um, a listing would have made 46% less during that time period than they did the year prior. So if they're making 10,000, now they're making 6,000, right? Um, and so that's a way mm -hmm. to kind of keep track of it. And huh. one thing that we have, one thing that we like is we just like these ones right in the middle that like when everyone else is kind of shifting and moving around, we just like to stay, find the ones that are kind of dead in the middle, even like a 5% decrease. We're okay with that, right? Uh 5% increase. We're okay with that as well, right? We just don't want to kind of, we want to stay with the, the stable markets rather than the ones that are kind of jumping up and dying down. Because if you look at all of these markets over here, these are all what I refer to as COVID markets, right? So these are the markets that everybody escaped to during COVID to get away from the cities, to get away from all that. And they were, and that's why like these little mountain towns, remote homes, they all blew up and did extremely well. And that's why the supply increased like crazy. But then this is May of 20 or April, May and June of 2022, right? Going into the summer, first summer without COVID really, like when we've gotten past it and everyone's like, let's go into the cities, right? Let's, let's get away. Let, let, let's go to the place we haven't gone in two years. And that's why you're seeing all these cities over here that are, that are doing extremely well. Right. So that's my, that's our way of tracking it. Our sort of like way of understanding it. Um, and those are the different data points that you can keep an eye on. Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. I do have some follow-up questions, but I'll wait and see if others. Okay. John, I have a quick question. Um, so this is really good, but how do you, do you have a signal when to sell the property? Like, you know, like what time do you decide? Okay, it's time to sell the property to get capital versus keeping it for cash flow. Is there a signal for that that you look at, or how how do you determine that? So my whole thing is Airbnb data, right? I just I'm trying to figure out. I just understand the data and the revenue and how much a potential property can make. 
the question that you're asking is essentially what are the macroeconomics of an of a market and when should when is the best time to sell for that market and that's i i'm telling you i have no idea what the answer would be to that question and i'm not even going to try and attempt to answer it because it will be uh inaccurate so i think I to that I think it's also something you decided earlier on, what are the projected returns you want to have? Because if you're pending on appreciations, you can tell if the market now meets the appreciation goal. If not, if you have long-term fixed that, you can just wait a little bit longer. So yeah, thought, my, my thought with that is like, are you, cons are you trying to sort of like sell at the top? Is that the idea? Or are you saying that uh, you're worried that a market will get oversaturated and then you're not going to be able to cash flow on that property and so then you should sell it before it gets oversaturated is that the question exactly yeah you just kind of like the exit strategy right uh gotcha. you, you run out you're getting airbnb cash flow like you showed their steady market you know really good stuff but then it's got to be a point where warning signs uh, warning here uh, time to get out or something like that um i'm so i may be biased with this opinion i'm mm -hmm. very bullish on on airbnb but I've only seen one market truly become oversaturated and that's Kissimmee, Florida, right? To the point where it's like, okay, we should probably get out, right? Every other market that I've ever looked at in like the trending data, I've never seen it get so bad or so oversaturated that you had to, had to run away, right? Um, and I'm gonna, I'll explain it in a second, but I wanna say first that the, the sort of safety net to that, to not worrying about oversaturation is putting together a listing that's better than everybody else's. And the way that you can put together a listing that's better than everybody else's is by studying everybody else's listing. And the sort of method that I just explained there of how you would go through everything, you mm -hmm. would have to study everybody's listing to figure out what works. And that's and once, once you have that sort of like buy box of the list of everything that you need, you actually know how to outperform every single person in that market. And that's gonna put you at that top 10% that you wanna be in. And that's where I think oversaturation isn't going to matter nearly as much for those people, right? And so it's just a matter of like being smarter than majority of people and putting a little bit more effort up front and that's going to help you in that situation mm -hmm. um but when but bring it bringing it back to kiss me florida is the only market where i've ever actually seen there to be oversaturation and to put this in context right uh chicago has i think around seven thousand listings right now and it is the third most traveled place in the entire united states somewhere around like 65 million people go there and there's about seven thousand listings that's it right New York has is the second most traveled place in the entire United States, and it has uh, about 70 million visitors, right? But it has 24,000 listings, right? So Chicago has 7,000, New York has 24, 24 to 30, somewhere in that range. Now, Kissimmee is the number one most traveled place to go to, and it gets around 80 million visitors per year, but it has somewhere between 50 and 100,000 Airbnb VRBO listings, right? Within that range. So if Chicago is is getting you know 65 million, which is about 15 million less, but still a crazy amount, and it only has 7,000 listings, but then you have uh, Kiss Me over here with 75,000 listings, almost let's say let's average it out, then there's clearly an oversaturation issue that's actually happening there, right? But that's the most traveled place with the most possible listings. It is the number one market in the entire United States for Airbnbs and everything, and that's where I've sort of seen oversaturation. No other market even comes close to that. So I guess that's why I'm, I'm not overly concerned about oversaturation in a lot of markets. Um, what I would be more concerned about is trends in the market, right? So as I was kind of showing with this graph here, um, anyone who jumped on this bandwagon of, of getting a remote cabin in the woods during that time period really felt, or sorry, during COVID really felt uh, the hurt when the that sort of COVID rush dropped off, right? And anyone who jumps on the bandwagon over here of getting into these little towns um, that are booming right now, just, just because they're booming right now as, we, as they're going through the summer, likely is probably feeling the hurt right now as we're getting out of the summer, right? So I'm not sure if that answers your question. I kind of gave a lot of information there and, and took a couple of different routes to try and answer that, um, but I hope that was somewhat helpful. <laughs> No, I think it helps. It's just like, uh, for instance, in Phoenix, the Super Bowl is coming, right? So I expect the Airbnb to jump like crazy and, and stuff like that. But is that a reason to buy a home in Phoenix, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's why you do your analysis and you pick the middle there for your market trend.
you can pick the middle. Yeah. Now, yep. now Phoenix might, might also be a, a great market, right? Um, and, and it might be the place that you're like, hey, you know what? This is where I want to go. I like going there. And I think that it can actually make money. Bonus, the Super Bowl is going there. So I'm going to make a bunch of money over that weekend, right? And then, however, moving forward, everything's good to go. Thank you. No problem. Um, I have a follow-up question. It's more about, are you also tracking uh, what's happening in the hotel space? No. Especially? Um, no, I'm not. I, I want to. Uh, just self personally, I want to, because I, I like, uh, I'm very interested in converting old hotels into unmanned Airbnb hotels. Um, and the data for hotels is different than it is for Airbnbs. Um, but I I did actually analyze a motel today um, and trying to understand exactly how much it would make based off of like how well studios are doing. It's it's not really the best way to do it, but uh, no, I unfortunately don't analyze the hotel data just yet. Thank or, you. Or, yeah, or midterm stays. I know that's a big thing that people ask a lot about now, um, like corporate rentals and stuff like that. I don't analyze that either. I don't have a great solution to it uh, just yet, but yeah, sorry. All right, then. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. So how do you filter on the HOA limitations, the Homeowners Association on Airbnb? I, I assume for uh, county laws and things like that, it's easy. But uh, I mean, do you buy the exact same uh, subdivisions is, is, is on here your, your McDonald's analogy or? Um. As like the other homes that are performing well? Is that the no, idea? no. So so if the HOA says you can't do an Airbnb in this neighborhood, how do you filter that out and accidentally buy one that you can't or get way down the process and then learn it? So every like almost um, there's no there's no like button you can click to to solve that. It's a it's a very uh, manual process that you have to go through to to make sense of that. Um, Nashville is a great example of this and I sort of have a standard response for this as well, right? So there's tons of regulation in Nashville and some places you're allowed to be in some places you're not. Now there's also tons of people in Nashville that are illegally operating Airbnbs in these places that they're not allowed to be in, right? I tell people, I'm like, don't go into that area. Just like I'm, you know, I'd say to you, don't buy a home in that HOA, um, but use that data to figure out how well they're doing and then take some of that information and apply it to a spot that you can do it, right? Um, and, and so like you're, you know, in your scenario, you're asking, you know, sh all the data I'm copying is for this one HOA. Well, I'm sure there'd be a bunch of, you know, other homes outside of that HOA that uh, probably have some data that you can use as well. And, and that would be where you could, you know, actually buy a home. And so you would buy a home outside of that HOA, but if there's data within the HOA, you just use that to understand what's working and then you apply it to your home outside of the HOA. Okay, so it sounds like when you get close, then it gets real manual. You have to go in and find out very site specific. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, I, when we go through properties, we're, we're clicking on it and we're always looking to see if there's an HOA or not. Um, we always talk to the realtor and ask the realtor, like, you know, what's the HOA laws here? Um, can we do it? Can we not do it? All that kind of stuff as you're going through it. If, if you see HOA, it doesn't mean you can't. You just have to figure out uh, what the rules are. But most of the time you can't, but sometimes you can. Thanks. No problem. Uh, one more question, John. How do you get like the cleaning crew and all that stuff? How do you source that or the property management? Do you have a team that does that or how do you deal with that? Uh, so I actually don't deal with that. Um, <laughs> so I have like, I just work on the data side when it comes to Super Host Labs. Um, and we have, you know, an operations team that deals with a lot of that stuff. However, I have managed an Airbnb cleaning. I, I sorry, I owned an Airbnb cleaning company for uh, my own homes in Chicago. Um, my recommendation is that you try and find either you, if you have one Airbnb listing, I strongly recommend that you just find um, a stay at home mom who's looking for something extra to do, who can clean your home. That's the best person that I've always found to work with. Um, and you can, you can find them on Facebook. You can put ads out on Craigslist. You can put ads out anywhere, uh, that, that essentially you want one person who you can rely on to clean the home 
and be able to run to the home if need be, right? That's if you have one Airbnb listing. As soon as you start to scale, that's where you want to introduce a company into the mix and get that company to that has Airbnb experience that's going to actually be able to um, get your every single one of your last homes cleaned properly every single time. Um, so that's you know company before, but if you just have one or two, a couple of reliable cleaners is hands down all you need, and a, and a good handyman, and you're good to go there. Perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, I, I have one question, uh, Daniel, and um, I, I think if, let's say if, um, if, if you own a property and you're, um, you're thinking about, it's, it's a historic property that um, was um, from sort of, it's a, it's a historic sort of older property, and you're not quite sure if the area that it, it's, it's in would be um, a good investment or a good to turn into an Airbnb or to do that activity. I'm just wondering how one would go about doing some analysis um, uh, of that to see if it would be worth um, sort of the effort to, to go through. So this would be sort of the current uh, owned existing property um, that has some historical cachet. It's, uh, it's actually next to Las Vegas in a small town called Boulder City. Um, and it was the dam director's town for uh, the building of, of Hoover Dam. But I, I, just, I just have no idea if that, there would be a good market for an Airbnb there, if it'd be worth doing some of the renovations or some of the other activities to turn it into an Airbnb or not. So just, just curious about something like that. Uh, what was the name of the city again? It's uh, Boulder City, Nevada. So I'd check on AirGNA just to see if there's any other um, people having oh, running Airbnbs there and just see how well they're doing. So as you can see here, there's 28 people. Uh, they're on average making around 3,500 a month. And then what you could do is you could hover over this data to try and see exactly how much they're making. Um, so here's an example, I'm trying to get that one there. So here's an example of a two bedroom that's making $77,000 a year, um, maybe a little bit more than that over the full year. So for, for something like that, for a really small location, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel and then go to my uh, playlist and look for this playlist right here, which is free Air DNA course 1.0. It's a free, 100% free course that teaches you how to walk through any location, that's especially a smaller one like this, and get the exact answer that you're looking for um, to determine okay. exactly how that property would be. Perfect. Thank you. Is, and do I need a do I need to get an Airbnb uh, subscription to just do to do that, or how does that work? You would need an AirDNA subscription to get that information. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I'm just. I was just curious. Um, we're we're looking at potentially doing doing something like that. So appreciate gotcha. it. Yeah. Of course. Um, take advantage of that free information. I have one other thing that I really want to show everybody. Um, that's okay. John, just one question. Is this air DNA only for US market or it's um, worldwide? The, the entire world. Okay. So anywhere there's data you can use, uh, air DNA is tracking it. Anywhere there's an Airbnb, air DNA is tracking it and they have it up on their um, site. Thank you. Okay. So this is this is something that I really want to show um, because I talked about going through the method and figuring out what works, what the different, what doesn't work, the criteria, right? Like really understanding what amenities and features are driving more revenue, things like that, right? And this is one of the best examples. And this is straight from Superhost Labs, right? This is one of our properties. Both of these properties are five bedrooms. They're blocks away from each other. They're both in Scottsdale. They're, they're almost the same square footage. There's probably about like a 400 square foot difference between these two. They both have pools in the backyard that are both heated as well, except that there's one crucial, crucial difference between them. And I'll explain it after I kind of go through it. So there's this one here, right? Which is, you know, I personally think is really well done. It's a really fun listing. It's really cool. If you look at the inside of it, um, it's, you know, it's pops of color, lots going on really, really nice kitchen, nice large kitchen, all this stuff, right? 
And then you have this one over here, which is once again, right down the street, almost a replica of this one, except, you know, you, nice backyard, everything going on. Once again, nice pop of color and everything. Cool. More things you get inside and you take a look at it. So the, what I'm, what I'm trying to show you here. Okay. Is that this home here, this first one, this second one, sorry, makes $60,000 more than this one over here. Okay. There's a $60,000 difference between these two. And they're literally blocks away from each other in almost the exact same thing. And by analyzing the data and analyzing every little last piece of it, you can figure out what the actual answer is to it, right? And what, what I love about this is that the actual answer is just simply that this backyard is significantly larger. It is 100% to do with the fact that the backyard is just really big. And the backyard allows for a lot of space and a lot of things for people to do within this backyard. So as you can see, it goes all the way back here and all the way over here. This here is $60,000 a year in profit, right? Which is beautiful. Like I, I love, I love, love, love that because it's such a, it's such a, it is somewhat subtle and you may think that it isn't as big of a factor as it was, as it is, but it's one of these things that if you understand that you can make $60,000 more, just like how if you have a pool heater, you can make $20,000 more. If you have a dining room in, in Chicago, you can make $20,000 more, right? And I want to give another example of like, okay, so if that works, we know that that, you know, that backyard is making us $60,000 more. Well, take a look at this one. This one has an even bigger backyard, right? So we, we have like a, uh, once we figured out the formula, then we just hunt for those more of those properties, right? Because you, you have a buy box, you know exactly what to purchase. And you're just waiting for it to come on market so you can actually buy it. So that's like one of my hands down favorite examples, because who wouldn't want to make $60,000 more by being really, really strategic with your purchase um, when you're actually trying to find those properties? Got so, it. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the rental arbitrage. Uh, how many of the listings are there you think uh, this, you may not have the data for, but just you think is based on rental arbitrage and uh, how many markets out there you think can still, what can allow you to do rental arbitrage? For example, in my area, you can't, uh, you have to physically own the property when you submit for the license. Um, just a general question. You may not have the answer, but I was curious. Sorry, Ed. I uh, definitely don't have the exact answer for that because I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of markets that have, um, you know, there's every, almost every major market has some sort of regulation around Airbnb at this point. Not every single one of those places requires you to own it. I, like very few actually require you to own the property. So rental arbitrage in that case would be allowed in a lot of markets. Um, but there is also a limitation of how many you can own in a lot of markets, right? Uh, just to, because of housing supply. So, you know, if you're going to be doing rental arbitrage, um, it really only works in major metropolitans, right? I don't recommend anyone to go to a vacation town and try to rent somebody else's home and turn it into an Airbnb because you're just going to get um, destroyed by everybody else because everybody else actually owns a property and they can invest in into the backyard. They can invest into the property, whereas you're just renting, right? And uh, you're not going to be putting a hot tub or, and a putting green into that backyard, whereas the actual homeowner will. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have the direct answer to that, but I do know for a fact that arbitrage works in a ton of markets and a ton of people are making money from it. So it is definitely a possibility. Thank you. Not my favorite though, if I'm being honest. It's much yeah. better to buy a property. Yeah, much better. Yeah, you, you actually, too. if you are doing arbitrage though, getting the data right is so important. It's not even funny because if you're doing rental arbitrage, right? You're renting to rent, you don't have an asset. You're paying a bunch for furniture and you're just the only way that you make money is if you make more than all of your expenses on a monthly basis. Right. And that's the only thing that you're relying on. And if you don't hit that, then you're just, you lost all of your money in the furniture that you spend. So. The only dangerous. thing about the rental, I haven't done arbitrage on the Airbnb via rentals, but it is the risk is relatively lower in terms of starting up cost for a lot of people, especially in the major metro areas, like you mentioned, they can just do like a two bedroom apartment. They don't really have to have that much amenities, but it's more like uh, you know, people getting it out on longer term stays. Yeah. 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 The risk is definitely lower. Definitely. Yeah. Hey, John, we just have five minutes left. Can you provide your contact information so people could reach out to you? Yes, I can. I'll put it in the chat. Um, my email 
is hello at pointanalytics.co. Hello at pointanalytics.co. You can also find me on all of the social media platforms under the Airbnb data guy. That's my handle for almost everything. Um, strong recommendation to check out my YouTube. My two YouTube's actually under my name, John Bianchi, uh, because I have three free Airbnb data courses on there that will teach you pretty well everything you need to know when it comes to Airbnb data. Um, and they're long form, so it's detailed and very analytical. So um, yeah, and my email is in the chat if anyone wants to do it. You can also reach out to me and we can hop on a 15 minute call. I don't, I talk to pretty well everybody. Um, I can send you my Calendly link. I'll actually put my Calendly link in here in case anyone just wants to book a call right now. Awesome. Thanks for being such a great guest. Could everybody take themselves off mute and thank him for coming in here and speaking to us? Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you, John. Very much, John. Thank you, John. It was thank awesome, you very John. much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, appreciate John. It. Great thank job. John. Thank, thank you. Really appreciate thank you, you, John. And next week, we'll be back with Cooper, who will be talking about global equity markets, particularly liquidity in the mortgage markets. See you all then. Thank you. I hope you feel better, Daniel. <laughs>